are back after a two-week hiatus. We took a bye week with the Bengals. We were off for Thanksgiving, um, and we have lots to discuss. Lucas, what do you think our uh, our big story of the week should be? Well, I it's the it's the thing that happened that. <laughs> Listen, uh, as far as quarterback injuries go, and tragic injuries to star players go. This didn't happen at a horrible time. It's not like we were sprinting towards the playoffs or this was one of our greatest teams. You know, if this is when it was going to happen in Joe Burrow's career, because we all knew it was going to happen at least one season. But if this is the one time, and, you know, hopefully it is the one time, this is kind of the one time you wanted it to happen. And that's what I was thinking when I was watching the game, which I actually didn't watch the game live, Matt. Because I had didn't watch out. this game live. No, what? I didn't. I didn't. Because I have worked till four and I, I, I don't like getting updates. Oh, wow. I don't like getting updates through the phone. I like watching it play by play because it helps us do a podcast, which yeah. after that game, I just started drinking, honestly. So <laughs> there wasn't going to be a podcast. That was rough. <laughs> but I, I got a buddy coming over and his girlfriend's coming over and they are aware of what happened but not aware of the score but they're not telling me because they don't want to spoil it i guess and kind of want to let me watch it my Surprise. girlfriend told me, my girlfriend already knew too and they're all making me yelling at me that i'm not watching a third and two in the third quarter or something <laughs> and i'm like i'm coming i'm coming and then boom he gets hurt and then i try to be hopeful about it i go Maybe it's a sprain. And, and then Jess immediately, she reads his tweet, says, see you next year, Joe Burrow. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay. Well, but whatever. I mean, it just was, it, it is what it is. It's football. It's going to happen. Just happened to happen to our guy at this moment. Um, but there's so many examples of season-ending injuries and in these types of injuries healing. When you, when you read any doctors, they're, they're not worried about it. This is not something that can really affect him long-term, especially because he's so young. The recovery process should be really good. You know, it is what it is. Just it's rehab time. That's all it is now. It's a new season. Yeah. It's a new game. And that was my favorite thing about Joe, Matt, is he just, he's got ripped up knee, ripped up ligaments, a whole bunch of stuff going on down in his knee. And he's just arms crossed and he's like, Time to rehab. Like it's just time to rehab. It's it all another day in the life. It's not a big deal. And I think that was important. You know, and and I think going back to the Carson injury and going back to some some terrible injuries, all of those guys almost are like, oh no, like I'm so oh man, this sucks. Right. And Joe was kind of more stoic. And I and I guess it's because they're two, six, and one, but at the well, same time, I think he's ready to just rehab. He's going to be throwing in early summer, so it'll be fine. He'll be throwing early summer. Yeah, you had you had mentioned before if it had to happen, if we knew it was going to happen, this was a good time for it to happen because we the Bengals are not a playoff team. The season was basically over. You're looking at Joe Burrow's first season, and you're going, "Wow, he, he's he's breaking rookie records." So I think. As, as a Bengals fan, as a Joe Burrow fan, it hurt more that it was Joe Burrow and just kind of took all, all the wind out of the sails for the entire season where it's kind of like, are, are, do I even want to watch anymore? It's kind of like your captain goes down and it's just like, all right, no one else get hurt. We're on to next year. And I think that's an important point, uh, you know, when we look at Zach Taylor, when your captain goes down, and this is something I've thought about over the past couple of days, because I've listened to Zach. I've tried to listen oh. to his reasoning about things. You know, I try to be an honest broker and judge people fairly and honestly and not overreact to things. I really do. And the thing about this team, when Joe went out and you see Zach yelling on the sidelines to these guys and deciding that as a coach, because you have a decision there as a coach, you can either decide you really have to have a feel of your team. If Joe Burrow goes out like that and you feel the wind come out of the sails, there's a different type of speech to give. 
Yeah. If you believe though, that you can rally the troops and you have those guys attention enough and they believe in you and they believe in the system enough to push forward in the face of adversity, that's when you do the yelling speech because you know that you got them and you can motivate them. And it totally flopped on its face. They were yeah. done, smoked. And when their captain, like you said, went down, when their dude, when their guy went down, you want as an organization, because he will go down again in a key situation. He will go down again for a three game stretch that'll decide playoff seating. He will go down again in potentially a third or fourth quarter of a playoff game. Yeah. You have to be ready for that. You have to, as a team, be able to have another person to look to and say that it's fine. He'll lead us through the storm, right? The greatest, the greatest armies have a good second in command always, right? Somebody that can carry the ship forward because if the one guy goes out, and it just completely collapsed, that's a leadership problem. That's a, it felt so dead and sad. Yeah. And that's not what you want to have floating around the organization when he's been there now a full two years and he has his guys in the building. Yeah. Zach Taylor in that post-game interview when they asked, what was the, like, the vibe, the morale of the team after Joe went down? Like, it was, it was obvious to anyone watching, like, they probably felt exactly what we felt on the couch, which was, well, shit, <laughs> there, there goes Joe, there goes the game, there goes the season. And for Zach Taylor, when he's asked that question to go, yeah, no, there wasn't really a change on the, on the sidelines. We, we just kind of, you know, we were pushing forward, sticking to the game plan, the game plan that's got us to this, you know, four and 30 fucking record. And for him to say that, any, any little minuscule amount of respect or trust that I had for Zach Taylor went away. And I went, that is the wrong thing to say in this moment. You, your franchise quarterback just went down. And your team is obviously affected by it. Oh, yeah. You cannot you cannot bring up Ryan Finley and Brandon Allen and go, that's all right. These guys are suitable replacements. They're, they're right there, maybe like one step below Joe Burrow's level. <laughs> and expect the fans and everyone to just be like, Zach Taylor's got this. All right, I was a little upset about it, but Zach Taylor steered me in the right direction. No, but that's, that's the thing is Brandon Allen and Ryan Finley are decisions made by this coaching staff. Yeah. Right. Michael Jordan being believed in was the decision made by this coaching staff. And he, and he, he preaches this thing of we're right there. We're right there. We're so close. The problem is, is when you're so close, so often you have to look in the mirror and go, what is it then? How come everybody else can win close and we can't? Why is it we Just seem have to, to get, turn the corner? Why is it we seem to get the short end of the stick? Yeah. Right. It, it, the common denominator is coaching because all guys circle in, circle out. And you can blame players all you want, and, and they're not executing. It's it is your job as a coach to win games. Win games any way you can, with any roster you can, with any personnel you can. Look what Bill Belichick is doing. You really think the Patriots roster is miles better than the Bengals? No. I, no, I don't think so. Cam Newton does not look great either. What about Carlos Dunlap? Like, yeah, that whole situation, I, I, that's, that's on the head coach. Whether it's Lou's fault or not, that's on the head coach. These guys coming in and not buying in and not understanding and not being able to be pushed forward and weird rumors of a toxic culture. You know, it could just be guys in the back end, but there are dudes rolling their eyes in the locker room. And that's what this record does to people. Yeah. All that talk, all that positivity, all that stuff. It's great when you're winning. It's not great when you're losing. You need a guy with answers, a guy with solutions, not a guy with we're right there. It just needs to break our way. And when it breaks our no, how are we going to get it to break our way? Not yeah. wait for dumb luck to strike the Bengals once every four weeks. And that seems yeah. to be Zach Taylor's strategy. If, if you as a head coach are struggling to get three, four wins in a season, stay the course is not what you should be saying. 
mean, look at Matt Nagy. You, you yeah. know, they're, they're hating this guy in Chicago. They want his head on a pike. And you know what he comes out and says, and he makes a statement. Hey, this, this stuff's got to change. We can't that play like this. That was embarrassing. Yep. Right? And that might blow up in Matt Nagy's face. But it's something that he knows he has to try. It, it's almost like Zach Taylor is completely unaware of what's happening in his own locker room. Yeah. Completely unaware. Because this culture is held together because he did bring in really good dudes. That has been one credit. I, I love the dudes they brought in. And so they're loyal. They're team-focused guys. They're never going to betray the coach. It's outside of their character. Joe Burrow's that guy. Giovanni Bernard's that type of guy. Logan Wilson's that type of guy they brought in. T got brought in by this. T Higgins is that type of guy. You don't have disruptors among Zach Taylor's guys. But they're even this close to being like, I, I it's not going to work. Yeah. It's not going to work. If you lose out, he's 27 games in. He's 4, 22, and 1. So if they lose out, how many games are left? Five? Yeah. 4, 27, and 1? Is, is that really what we're going to go with into 2021? Well, so, I mean, that, that's a good question. With five games left, I mean, with, with Joe Burrow and with momentum, especially after beating the Titans, we were thinking they can win most of these games, more than half of these games. But now they're going to have the Dolphins. They're going to have the Andy Dalton Cowboys. They're going to have the Steelers, Texans, Ravens. Are they going to win any of these games? Well, I mean, do you know the Bengals have a winning record in December over the past 20-something years? So... We'll see. And the Bengals have won 17. This is from The Athletic. They've won 17 straight home finales with a losing record. 17 straight? 17 straight home finales with a losing record, which is guaranteed to happen week 17 against Baltimore. <laughs> okay. So well, that's, I guess they're winning. Something to look Baltimore. forward to, I guess. I will, I'll start Ryan Finley in fantasy that week. They're going to beat Baltimore, which <laughs> just see, it, it's going to have to be a win like that for Zach Taylor. If this organization is going to bring him back, here's a couple scenarios and who they're best for the best scenario for Zach Taylor is winning two or three games down the stretch. Mm -hmm. And then having some mobility with the fourth or fifth or sixth pick in the draft, trading back and flooding the room with more guys. Because he'll get brought back if you can win two or three, no doubt. Yeah. Um, and I might even say, sure, let's give it a go. Um, although I don't think it would work. The best thing for Bengals fans is Zach Taylor loses out, gets fired. New guy gets Penny Sewell, one of the best left tackles in a generation. Must have. You, go, you kick Jonah, Jonah over to right tackle. You spend some money on guard in the free agency. Then you have Spain and Suafilo for depth. I like Hopkins in the middle. That O-line all of a sudden is top 15 in the league. And then you can spend even more on defense or fill in guys in the draft. And Joe Burrow comes back like a spring chicken 2021. Fresh <laughs> environment, new coach. Maybe it's Eric Bieniemy. That's the dream. Mm. That, if, if we can groove into 2021 like that with a, with a new staff, somebody like an Eric Bieniemy who's respected around the league says, no, I believe in Joe Burrow. And I'm going to go down there in Cincinnati. We're going to go win some games. That would be really exciting. Um, yeah. for this that Cincinnati. is exactly what needs to happen. I want you to write all of that down. We're going to mail that <laughs> every week until it happens. The worst thing that'll happen, and probably this is probably what we're going for here. The worst thing that would happen would be them scratching out a win and that pushing them down to the fourth pick and they'll mm -hmm. lose out on Sewell. And they'll keep Zach Taylor. That's a disaster. So or, one win would screw us out of that? Potentially. Yeah. There's a lot of three-win teams, and there's weird tiebreakers. That tie with the Eagles might end up saving us, I guess. So it's just I, – I just don't think Zach Taylor's the answer. And him hanging around and winning one game, let's say he upsets the Ravens in Week 17 with the Ravens trying to make the playoffs, pull off some crazy upset – yeah. Um, because things break their way and the organization's like, you know what, this guy, he's got it figured out. If we'd have had Joe Burrow, they would have been almost a 500 team. We're bringing him back. This has to collapse for Mike Brown to pull the trigger. 
it's yeah. got to look bad like it just did every week. And and I think that might happen, but I don't know. I I, I, I hope that that happens. And I've I said this to my friend. I was calling Zach Taylor a palate cleanser from Marvin Lewis to yeah. the guy. Just like kind of like how, how Hugh Jackson was in Cleveland. It was kind of like a, they had to just lose every single game for two seasons. He was the palate cleanser. You get rid of, you flush everything else out from the past couple of decades, and then you move on to the actual guy that's going to move the, the franchise forward. And I, I will continue to call Zach Taylor a palate cleanser, even if he comes back next year. It'll just be, oh, well, we got a lot to flush out. So he just <laughs> needs another year to get rid of all of this shit from the past couple of decades until we find the actual guy. Yeah, but if you're Eric Bieniemy, I don't know why you wouldn't want this job. Yeah. I really don't. Um, unless the, the Mike Brown uh, – but unless the Brown family is not willing to pay him the salary he wants, I suppose, or unless he Good does day. not want to work for this organization. But this is a – and listen, if you're the Bengals, you can go to Bieniemy and say, we made a mistake by not hiring you two years ago. That's our bad. But here's what our mistake gave you. Joe Burrow and Penny Sewell. Can you work with that? Gave you T. Higgins as well. Yeah. And you are this team is in a much better position than when you would have been brought in two years ago. So it's actually a happy accident that mm-hmm. we missed and got Zach Taylor. That's what this era can look like. You're exactly right. It can look like a happy accident. If you pivot, quick get out. The Joe Burrow injury could happen in a year where there were no fans anyway. You can have a completely new era with a lot of positivity and a lot of excitement already attached to it. And then you get the new true new era. You're exactly right. Yep. Into the season with fans. And then it'll feel like Joe Burrow's true rookie year. And it'll feel fresh and new and it'll be, it'll be exciting. And I think we'd be a potential playoff team. I really exactly do. that that is the optimism that's why I'm considering this whole thing just a Zach Taylor palate cleanser until we move on to actually being a winning team with Joe Burrell yeah, all right Joe's, uh Joe's like I don't want to play for this guy anymore just rip, <laughs> rip it up John <laughs> I mean if Joe Burrell came out and said something like that he has not been he has not thrown his O-line under the bus he hasn't thrown Zach Taylor that's just not the kind of guy he is I don't know if we if we get another year and they go, they go three and thirteen. If he's just gonna go, Zach Taylor's not the guy, and walk out in the <laughs> end of the press post game conference, and they're just like, "Oh, all right, yeah, no, he but, really meant that." But Mike Brown needs to sit down with Joe. See, this is why their relationship is so important, and I think Joe knows that because you you heard the way he was, the the respect he's really put on Mike Brown early. Yeah, and I think Joe knows how important that owner because listen. Joe has some dudes that have really been throughout the NFL, have navigated the NFL, have executed trades in the NFL, free agent moves. That's his mentor group, the Mannings, right? Archie did some moving for Eli. Peyton did some moving into Denver. They know how to pull the strings in in the NFL. And Joe is probably knowing my relationship with Mike Brown is the key to all this. Yeah. Because he needs to be able to go into a meeting room with Mike Brown and say, I will never say this in front of the team ever. This is not the type of player I am, but if you want my honest opinion, I don't think Zach Taylor's the coach and be able to say, I mean, he, he, he's got clout. He should be able to go do that and make some actual moves. If Mike Brown is believing that Joe Burrow is the franchise quarterback, that's something that someone that he can build this team around Joe Burrow saying anything like that should be moving pieces. Or even like Joe saying, well, I think we can win with them, um, but I think we can win with a lot of other guys too. Just even that, like to Mike, it's just like, come on, get him out. What Joe can't do is go up to Mike and go, I really like him. We really need to keep him. And I, I don't think Joe's going to do that. Um, no. I, I don't think so. Because this, listen, the disrespect aura, that's not exclusive to outside the Bengals locker room and outside the people around the Cincinnati Bengals and these players' families. Yeah. It's not. I'm sure that thought is floating out there. Yeah. All right, but ending optimistic before we move on to fantasy football. Optimistic. Playoffs next year, maybe. Playoffs next year, maybe. (laughs) There we go. 
<laughs> like Bengals fans every year next year's our year we just hit that a little earlier this year than last year or than previous years all right uh fantasy football under COVID we are recording this on Tuesday we have the Ravens game that keeps getting postponed uh we were talking about fantasy football before we we jumped on here we are both commissioners of our respective leagues um I got people asking me what happens if this game isn't played. What well, what do you what do you think uh, is going to happen, and what what are you going to do as commissioner if it's not played? Yeah, tough cookies. <laughs> <laughs> tough cookies, man. Welcome to 2020. Like, sorry, I'm not gonna. Uh, no, tough cookies. I don't think it affects any matchups in terms of flipping wins in our league. I, it probably will in mine. I got seven teams that are six and five fighting for the playoffs right now. Well, see, I don't know. You got to establish something beforehand. If you don't establish something beforehand, I would say tough cookies, right? If you don't say before the week or before the season, hey, if a game is pushed back, pushed back, pushed back, canceled, we'll, we'll put in the best replacements for those or have – hey, you have to name what your replacements would be for this COVID-effective game. Yeah. And then I can switch them out for you. So you could have dual lineups running for a contingency. But if, if you don't agree that and let everybody know have. that that's happening beforehand, because I, I, I always think of both teams, and that's what you got to do as a commissioner, right? Mm-hmm. Both sides. If you're a team that is going against them and now you're going to benefit that the COVID game is happening, Like, I would want you changing it arbitrarily and then putting in his best lineup, which he theoretically might not even have played had he known this game would be canceled. So now you're helping him out with his lineup making by putting in the three highest point total guys. Like I have, I have a thread on ESPN that basically says for, for potentially COVID affected players, tell me who you think might not start and who the replacement would be. And it's, it's been used, you know, maybe one or two times a week. But for this game, it got pushed three, four separate times. People did not do that prior to the oh, then they're done. type of weeks. So, <laughs> you tough cookies. Done. I am trying to decide. Tough cookies. I, hey, I do not this know. video. Like, hey, look at me. Sorry, bro. You should have sent in your replacements. You didn't. You lost. It happens. Sometimes the guy's going to get a sprained ankle in the second quarter, right? What if you had Joe Burrow on your fantasy team in the third quarter to make the playoffs and his ACL gets ripped in half? It happens. That's fantasy different. Football. See, so this is not like an injury. So with COVID, that takes the entire team out, the entire game out. It is not someone who is doubtful or questionable and you're like, oh, well, maybe I shouldn't play this person. That game was supposed to be played. Okay, but what? But the, in, the in backup prior... tight end went to a frat party and came back with COVID, and now your quarterback, your entire team can't play. That is definitely something that should be outside of the realm of an injury in the third quarter. No, I, I listen. The NFL's handling it like the Denver Broncos go out, go play without a quarterback. We don't, we don't care. We're not moving the game. We're not moving the game. We, we don't care. These are the rules. We've established this. Right? You established rules. Hey, if you don't send in your replacement players p- p- before, then tough cookies. They're, nobody's going to get replaced. And, and how are you going to do that? You're Matt? a tough cookie commissioner. <laughs> Matt, how are you going to do that? How are you going to say that? Because, okay, what if they had two wide receivers that they could have replaced Chase Claypool with, and one of them's got 27 points and the other has eight? So now you're going to have to put the 27 in. If I'm the other guy, I'm going, well, what if he would have played the guy that has eight points because he was projected more before the week? You're going down a rabbit hole. I would say probably the next man up looking at the ESPN rankings. That's it. That's it. It doesn't matter if it's more. It doesn't matter if, if he would have played them. That is the next person. And this is something that I will put to a vote. I'm going to put, you're, you're going to have this your guys This is one of those rioting. dumb things that democracy would pass. This is why you have courts. Because <laughs> the law is the law. It's tough cookies, man. It's yeah. out. You you wrote the you wrote the rules beforehand. It You knew this could happen. That's why you put the rule in. You did that as commissioner. You put the I'm rule gonna in. I'm going to have to check. 
and they did not utilize said rule. And then something happened that you had already stated could potentially happen. It's not like a hurricane came by and canceled a game on a Monday night with like all the players. Or a COVID. It's not a COVID, but we knew this was happening. It got moved from Thanksgiving. I, I, we've known since Wednesday this was a COVID-affected game. So plenty of time, plenty of run-up. Tough cookies. Those are losers. They lost their matchup. They're, they're, those are losers. I'm going to have to check to see if any of those games are going to flip. If, if someone would win because of that game, not uh, if, if the game is not played. Well, I'm going to have to look at that. Man, I just had to do a ruling. Ball. You can't change I just. Ball. I just had to do a ruling on uh, Taysom Hill because ESPN had him as a quarterback and tight end. So someone won last week because he was in his in the tight end slot. He was a tight end. <laughs> and then ESPN wasn't m- moving him out. So he he they removed the tight end capability. He was quarterback only for this past week. But if he was already in your tight end slot, you would have an illegal lineup, but if you didn't change anything, you could still play. Ooh. Well, so that, that was one. kind of like a like a loophole type of <laughs> that one. I'd say you gotta kick him, you gotta put him in quarterback if you want him in. But yeah. when he was a tight end and he played quarterback, he was a tight end. I had him on my bench and I cut him and I felt like an idiot. Like I yeah. wasn't as a commissioner gonna be like, no, 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 Taysom Hill. No, because it, it, he's listed as a tight end. Yeah. Right? Like if, if, if Jerry Judy had gone back there and thrown passes for the Broncos, like you just have those points. If there's a halfback pass, you get those. That points. game was absurd. Did you, yeah, was did you watch any of that game? Yeah, I, I, it was, it was entertaining to watch. I watched that as Tyreek Hill on my fantasy team. Yep. I had Tyreek Hill in the first quarter. Like it was on red zone. And every time it flipped to him, it was Tyreek Hill. And I said, oh, man, he's got like 200 yards. I've already got in the first quarter 40 yeah. points won this matchup already division yeah. champion nine and three. Now it's been a good year. I am. I am right on the cusp in the hunt. I had some rough, like less than five point losses, probably like four of those throughout the season. I am, uh, I'm fighting scored almost 200 points though with diary Gill and everything this week. We will see how that goes. Yeah, well, fantasy, I've never, this is my eighth season, and I've been the commissioner for every single one, and I don't have a championship. And I'm I'm a consistently really good player, and I've had good teams, and I've lost in the championship, and I've been Ooh. in the semifinals. Ooh. So it's a real, like, it's a real struggle. I only do one you league got, a year. You have too much Bengals stuff around you. <laughs> it's <laughs> negatively affecting your fantasy games, too. I, I hope not, man. I think that with that Joe Burrow injury, I think that the fan, the football gods should, you know, let you win this year. That's I'm not going to fantasy say football. I'm not going to say. It. All right, Joe Burrow went down. Lucas needs it this year. Oh, it'd be it'd be great. I'd be like, what what a great football season. I mean, <laughs> love it. Money in my pocket, pride gleaming. <laughs> there you go there's there's hope not a lot of hope for the Bengals, but hope for our <laughs> Lucas fantasy football team but most likely i'll get the first round by and and because kamara's collapsing and then tyree kill's gonna have a bad week and aaron Rodgers is gonna throw two picks and i'm gonna score 86 points and lose in yeah. the finals that that's usually if i lose in the playoffs i lose that first week and then i just obliterate in the final two and i'm just like well that would have been great if I could have got through into that that next round there. The fantasy playoffs are a brutal place. They are a torturous, torturous place of many losses of mine. I got tossed into, into a, such a basket, I remember, with my best team ever. You remember the year the Broncos and Peyton Manning had like 55 touchdown passes? Yep. I, I had, had Peyton Manning, Demarius Thomas, Julius mm-hmm. Thomas, Wes Welker. It was That was the team. And it, I was like, yeah, this is great. And because of the way the week shook out, I wasn't going to have enough points because those guys were injured or sitting and it, it worked out weird. I had the best team all year. And in the championship game as a last ditch effort, I had to start Andy Dalton and AJ green <laughs> on Monday night oh, no. football to hope they combined for enough points to bring me over the top. 
And oh, it didn't no. happen. It, d- it didn't happen. And I lost the fantasy championship. Um, my team because name was Manning, Manning United FC, and I didn't even play Peyton Manning in the championship. Wow. It wouldn't have mattered anyway. So. Wow. Heartbreak across the board. Yeah, that's that's sports for me. <laughs> that's, it's, that's sports for you. Except in uh, soccer, because I'm a German citizen, so I like Germany. There you go. Win, and then Bayern Munich, they win. Yeah, those are the only I have alerts on for all the teams, and it's just like, okay, the Reds lost. Bengals lost and oh Bayern Munich won nine to one <laughs> yeah there we go oh uh, they they've been a great bet for like 40 straight games I mean yeah. they're 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 just incredible incredible all right I think that's it for us right that is it we are back every week see you next week oh another loss please i can't if they if they beat we're rooting this- for losses now we're rooting for more palate cleansing losses i can't wait to not watch